You know, it's interesting. Uh, Rand Paul, uh, who's running for Senate in Kentucky, is with us here. But it's interesting you bring that up about the promotion of uh, of hysteria and all oh, the sky is falling. We don't every day that we wait. If we don't do this, we we, we risk the real danger, real destruction to the general economy. Said Lanny Davis. I uh, am reminded that a, a gentleman, and I'm sure you're familiar with him, named Robert Higgs, wrote a great book. It's called Crisis in Leviathan, and it's all about the ratchet effect, about how whenever there's a crisis that comes along, and Wrong Emanuel famously said we can't let a good crisis go to waste, whenever a crisis comes along, government uses this because it is a uh, living, breathing a parasitical organism, it uses it as a ratchet to say, well, we're going to have to step in, and the government's the only mechanism that can fix this. Obama says it all the time. And I'm reminded that in the uh, in the debates over ratifying the Constitution, this is the exact argument that was used. I mean, we were basically founded on the ratchet effect, that the guys that were known as Federalists said, hey, we, you got to ratify this because we don't know. We think France may attack us tomorrow. There's great concern over there about the uh, the worthless money that's floating around here. So to, to segue to a, to an actual question about that, your, um, your dad is with an organization, and uh, thank, thank the Lord that he is, called Campaign for Liberty. These guys have uh, came out of nowhere after your, your father's uh, presidential campaign, and began promoting the cause of liberty and limited government. How do you see, in your travels around the country and around Kentucky, how do you see the crowds of people and those that you have met that may be our Campaign for Liberty members or want to find out about the issue of liberty? Is there an actual revolution for liberty and for limited government going on out there, in your opinion? Yeah, I think so. Everywhere you go, the revolution is still alive, and people hunger for something different. And it's not, like I say, it's not a Republican-Democrat thing. They're, they're hungry for truth. They're hungry for someone who will speak truth to power and will say government has grown too large at the behest of both parties, special interest on both sides of the aisle. You know, we often say that when you look at the budget and you say, how are you going to do this? Republicans look at it and say, oh, we cut the welfare queen off and we'll balance the budget. Well, there's not enough money there, and it's not the truth. There's a lot of corporate welfare out there, big right. business. I mean, for example, Exxon made great profits last year, and I'm all for it. I wish them the best. That is great. I hope their executives make a lot of money. But we shouldn't be sending money from the taxpayer to help them with research and development. That's ridiculous. So we actually have government funds that are going to oil companies for research and development, and I think that's just kind of crazy. Well, and that may be the end result of uh, this impending crash and this impending doom. I mean, Rand, you don't you're not just have uh, money going to Exxon. I mean, there are tens of tens and maybe hundreds of billions of dollars per year that are filtered throughout various think tanks. These people produce nothing. There's no aggregate uh, end result to the uh, to the existence of a think tank that lives inside that ten mile square area designated in the Constitution, uh, as your dad likes to talk about all the time. And he's made me a student of this, and he's made me look it up, and made me reconsider what I thought was conservative foreign policy, which is something you'll have to deal with in the United States Senate. And it is not... The, the thing that amazes me, after I historically researched this, is that the conservative foreign policy position has always been against war. But now we're told by the Decepticons, as I call them, that no, no, conservatives have always been for war. Isn't there a difference between readiness and actual uh, implementation and, uh, as your dad likes to call it, empire building? And how would, you, how would you approach foreign policy? Well, I think when you look at the Constitution, there are a few enumerated rights, but probably the primary enumerated right is national defense. I think it is right. very important and primarily what the federal government should be doing. Yes. I think you have to define that, though, and I think that we should always see war as a failure of diplomacy. I think we should always see war in personal terms. I have three boys, and there are times we have to fight for our country, but they should be few and far between, and they shouldn't be 130 wars going on every year in parts around the world that we have to be involved with. The other thing is is that when we do go to war, the Constitution calls for declaration of war. Right. And if one senator stands up, sometimes he can stop the proceedings. And if I were in the Senate in the last few years, I would have halted the proceedings and said, 
you must declare war to go to Afghanistan, and you must declare war to go to Iraq. But I would have voted to declare war to go to Afghanistan, but I would have voted against a declaration of war with Iraq. Interesting, very interesting. Well, listen, I know uh, our time is uh, limited. We've got to go. You've got to, uh, to move on to other shows. Of course, I wish you the best, my friend. We'll have you on between, uh, back on between now and, uh, and, and the election. Where are you headed to next, Rand? We're headed to some more uh, national radio programs, and then we have a national conference call with print media. And then later this afternoon, I'm flying back to Kentucky, and tomorrow I have to do my day job and see, pa <laughs> see patients because I'm just like the rest of you folks out there. I've got a mortgage and got to take care of my family also. Well, uh, Godspeed. Uh, Rand Paul, you can reach him at Rand Paul, that's R A N D E P A U L 2010.com. Real revolutionary for a real revolutionary. You know, I don't want to call you a revolutionary because somebody's going to seize on that. Why, oh, you see there? You see there are a bunch of revolutionistas out there, all these campaign for liberty guys. So, a real uh, fan of the revolutionaries of the founding era. Let me put it to you that way. And, uh, I, uh, I certainly enjoyed our time together. You know I'm a fan. You know I'm a friend. Uh, we're always here. Whenever you uh, you have an issue you'd like to you uh, you want to discuss, you're always welcome. And Godspeed to you, my friend. Thank you, Mike. The rebirth, the rebirth of conservatism starts now. Serious Patriot 144 starts now. And in the talk category of the Serious XM iPhone app starts now. I hope you enjoyed uh, Rand Paul's interview. I want to stress to you, but Mike, you were just a butt munch. You were out there. Could you could you ask him a tough question? I... <clears throat> I asked him as tough a question as anyone has ever asked Obama. And I want to tell you something. For the first time in my adult lifetime, I am actually proud of my U.S. Senate races in my country. You're listening to the Mike Church Show on Sirius XM. Patriot 144 and America Right 166.